Hi, my friends. Welcome back to Storytime. Tonight, I'm going to read a story titled Miss Jaster's Garden by N. M. Bodecker. In a corner of a garden overlooking the sea at Sandgate lived a small spiky animal called a hedgehog, Hedgy for short. In the middle of the garden lived Miss Jaster in Villa Pax, a, in a square whitewashed house with ornamental flower pots on the front steps. Now the two did not see much of each other because Hedgy was by nature nocturnal and Miss Jaster was not. But occasionally they met just after sunset when they both enjoyed strolling in the garden. On these occasions, Miss Jaster would go back into the house and return a few minutes later with a saucer of milk, which she placed at what she hoped was the right end of the hedgehog. But mm, hedgehogs being the shape they are and Miss Jaster being a little nearsighted, as often as not, she put the saucer where the hedgehog's head wasn't. And Hedgy, so as not to cause distress, politely dipped his tail in the milk and pretended to drink. Later, when Miss Jaster went into the house and lit the lamp on the piano, he drank the milk properly. Through the open door, he could hear Miss Jaster at the piano, her fingers fluttering up and down the keyboard, picking out little tunes as sweet and unpredictable as April showers. Hedgy liked being played for while he had his milk, and Miss Jaster enjoyed someone having someone to play for. This way, they lived happily for a while. Then one bright May morning, when the air was soft and full of birdsong, Miss Jester came into the garden to do her spring planting. She wore a purple morning dress and sturdy shoes. She had a large straw hat trimmed with cornflowers on her head and pulled behind her a small four-wheeled wagon full of gardening tools and envelopes of flower seeds. She carried a large green watering can with the letters JJ for Jessica Jaster, painted on it in blue. And because the sun was bright and because her eyes were a little watery from reading planting instructions, she wore her dark glasses. These glasses made everything look brownish gray, the same color as the empty flower bed she was about to seed and the same color as Hedgy who was asleep in the middle of it. The flower bed was on the south side of the house, a protected nook out of the wind and in full sun. It was the first spot Miss Jaster planted each spring. She raked the bed lightly with a small rake and sprinkled the seeds evenly. Marigold and baby's breath and patches of sweet William. She showered it generously with her watering can, never suspecting that a small spiky animal was in the middle of it. At first, Hedgy thought of moving to a safer spot, but his quills did need combing and he rather enjoyed having his back scratched, so he stayed. He hardly felt the seeds at all. They were like dust, dust settling among his quills. As for the shower from the watering can, it was like a gentle rain, not at all unpleasant after the heat and the dust. When Miss Jaster went into the house to have lunch, Hedgy went back to sleep, enjoying the most perfect dreams. Every day after that, Miss Jaster came with her watering can to sprinkle the flower bed and watch her green shoots. And every night, 
Hedgie wandered through the garden, sniffling and nibbling the way hedgehogs do. But after a while, he began to feel restless. Something was happening and he didn't know what. But deep down among his quills, something was stirring and squirming, like a thousand tiny fingers touching and tickling his skin. He was so itchy he couldn't sleep and so curious he had to know just what was wrong. Down by the tool shed where Miss Jaster filled her watering can in the afternoon was a small puddle of clear water, for the tap was worn and kept dripping. Hedgie used it as his mirror, and down to this mirror he went to have a look at himself. But when he got there and leaned over the puddle, he stood quite still for several moments, curling and uncurling his toes in disbelief. What he saw in the water was not his ordinary gray, brown, prickly self, but something quite, quite different. Peeping out from among his quills were little spikes and shoots of green with leaves and some tendrils ready to climb and bloom and fill with bees and honey. Well, he said to himself, now I'm either a flower bed or a vegetable garden. I wonder which. And he kept looking at himself and wondering till another drop from the tap broke the picture into a thousand pieces. When Miss Jaster came with her watering can that evening, Hedgie was back in his old spot and the whole flower bed was full of little spikes and shoots of green. So pleased was Miss Jaster that she played the entire Blue Danube waltz on her piano twice before going to bed. But Hedgie was only half listening flower bed or vegetable garden, vegetable garden or flower bed, he kept saying to himself, which am I, I wonder. <clears throat> the fact was that during the day he had had the most alarming dreams. First he dreamt that he was covered with tomato plants. One by one the tomatoes ripened and dropped off the vine, squashing on his head, ripping on his quills till he looked as if he were covered in tomato sauce. Then the vines changed. They grew longer and heavier trailing 20 feet behind him, covered with large yellow flowers. Melon flowers, thought Hedgie, and in his dreams the flowers turned into huge ripe melons, dozens of them dragging behind and growing till he could not move another step. At the moment he woke up, all over him and around him were growing plants. If only he could be sure they were not tomatoes or melons. Early the next morning, he went to the tool shed, nosing about under the tables and among the flower pots till he found the seed packs, half hidden under Miss Jaster's garden gloves. A few seeds were left in each, so Miss Jaster, Jaster had kept them for use later in the summer. Hedgie pulled the packs out on the floor in front of him, marigolds and baby's breath and fragrant sweet William. He did not know their names, but he did recognize the pictures on the packs. They were neither tomatoes nor melons. Whew, much relieved, he went to have a look at himself in the puddle. I believe I shall be quite handsome, he said, and toddled off to bed. Not many days ahead. After this, Hedgie woke up early in the morning feeling the presence of a strange new something that hadn't been there the day before. It wasn't actually a sound, and it wasn't exactly a touch. It wasn't really a taste, and it certainly wasn't a sight, for his eyes were tightly closed. For a while, he lay quite still, wiggling his nose and 
sniffing. It's a smell, he thought, but a smell with something else in it. A hum of bees, a touch of sun, and, and when he opened his eyes, the flowers were all around him. Marigolds and baby's breath and patches of sweet rose. I'm in bloom, cried Hedgy, and hurried down to the tool shed to look at himself. But no matter how long he looked or how hard he tried, he could find only one word to describe what he saw. Stupendous! And even that was really not the word he wanted. While he stood there in the sunshine, a little dazed, not knowing what to do next, a small cloud of butterflies and bees gathered around him, fluttering and humming. Hedgy didn't mind. He was not afraid of bees. After all, a bee has only one stinger, he thought, but I have two hundred. And whoever heard of anyone being afraid of butterflies? But Hedgy wasn't really thinking of the hum and flutter around him. Something inside him was fluttering and humming, bursting to get out. The special kind of whatever it is that makes birds sings, sing and poets make poetry and puppy dogs chase their tails. While he was thinking of this, his feet began doing little dance steps in the dust, all on their own. One moment they looked as if they were waltzing, the next moment they were doing a tap dance, then a skip and a jump, then a slow turn around the puddle. Oh, it cannot be helped, thought Hedgy, as he waltzed into the flower bed. I really shouldn't do this, he said, as he jumped over the marigolds. But I absolutely must, he cried, as he burst onto the lawn, skipping and jumping and kicking his heels. Around the fish pond he raced under the garden seat and into the sun. Behind him trailed the bees and butterflies like a noisy cloud of flower petals. Tomorrow I'll be quiet as an earthworm, thought Hedgy, but not today. Today is the greatest day in my life. There'll never be another like it. And the bees and the butterflies, tired of ch chasing their food around the lawn, hoped he was right. Miss Jaster had been dozing in her wicker chair when she saw, or believed she saw, a small patch of her flower bed jump onto the lawn and head for the gate. At first she thought it was a dream, but when she found that she was quite awake, she said the first thing that came into her head. Stop thief! She called, and then at the top of her voice, Stop thief! In a flash, Hedgy saw that she was right. The flowers were hers, not his. Taking them out of the flower bed, even if it was only to perform a midsummer dance around the fish pond, really made him a kind of a thief. If only Miss Jaster had remained in her chair, Hedgy would have gone back to his place in the flower bed, much chastened. But she jumped up, waving her parasol, and poor Hedgy, now quite frightened, dashed through the gate and down the road to the village. In a small cloud of dust many yards behind came Miss Jaster, her knitting, her parasol, and her cries for help. Then up the road from the village came a police constable on his bicycle, making what speed he could uphill toward Miss Jaster, carrying a parcel to his sister in Wimsley. For Hedgy, there was only one thing left to do. He scurried in among the flowers on the roadside and lay stuck still, hoping he would not be seen. Half an hour later, Wimple, the constable, handed Miss Jaster her knitting over the garden gate. After much listening on the dusty road, he at last understood or believed he understood what had happened. I quite understand, Miss, he said, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. But 
One last question, please. Did you by any chance happen to notice how many legs these flowers had when they made their getaway? In round numbers, Miss Jaster tucked her knitting under her arm and straightened her straw hat. A great many, constable, she said firmly. A great many. Wimple licked his pencil and added to his description of the fugitive legs. He wrote, numerous. Very good, miss, he said. We'll have your zinnias back in no time at all. Marigolds, Miss Jaster went, said and went into her garden. Of course, said Wimple, and moved off down the road. In the 16 years he had been in Sandgate on the sea, no one had ever reported a missing flower bed. Sometimes the kid, kids pick a few plums or apples that aren't exactly theirs, he thought, and sometimes I suppose they pick a few flowers that, strictly speaking, belong to someone else. Well, but when flowers start running off on their own, Wimple shook his head sadly, and there's another thing. How do you punish a flower bed or a watermelon? The constable stopped in the middle of the road and put his helmet back on. It was a very hot day. He tried to decide how he should begin. Put yourself in the fugitive's place. The chief constable always said, imagine you were running away. Where would you hide? If I were a flower, thought Wimple, a flower, he could imagine himself being a cabbage or a watermelon, and for some reason even an artichoke. But a flower? Hmm. He looked around. Where would a flower? Uh, of course, he said, slapping his hand against his helmet. That's where I should hide among the other flowers. He straightened himself up, brushed a little dust off his sleeve, and started down the road poking among the weeds and wildflowers, looking for marigolds and baby's breath and a patch of sweet William. But it was nearly sunset two days later before he brought Hedgie back to Villa Pax on a leash. Never in his life had Hedgie felt so tired and so hopelessly small. He, his feet were sore. His flowers had wilted. He was weary, worried, bedraggled little animal down on his luck. Goodness sakes, said Miss Jaster. It's the hedgehog. Flower hogs more like it, said Wimple, but Miss Jaster had already gone into the house. Presently she came back with a saucer of milk. This time she took no chance, but knelt right down, right on the garden steps, and put that milk in front of Hedgie. She was quite sure this time, for she saw his eyes, like two tiny drops of India ink in the fur, and they were looking straight into her own. Miss Jaster had to clear her throat twice before asking the constable to get the watering can. A little later, freed from the leash and fed and showered, Hedgie toddled back to his flower bed. The constable, having enjoyed a little homemade gooseberry wine and chat about annual boarders, returned to the village. Miss Jaster lit the lamp on her piano, but tonight her heart was not in the Blue Danube waltz. She kept thinking of the friendly little flower hog and the frightful scare she must have given him. After a while, she turned off the lamp and sat looking into the garden till the ro moon rose beyond the junipers. Early the next morning, Hedgie met Miss Jaster on the front steps. She was carrying a tray with her own breakfast and Hedgie's milk. That morning, and many mornings after, they had breakfast together by the fish pond, Miss Jaster in her wicker chair and Hedgie in the grass. 
After a leisurely breakfast, they went for a walk along the beach, followed by a small but persistent butterfly. At the end of the breakwater, they sat down, Miss Jaster dangling her feet in the water, Hedgie resting his nose on his paws. And there was nothing but peace and sunshine and a touch of sweet earth.